Hi, I'm MJ Hecox here at Leopold's where we pair our wine with books. So for this month's pairing, we've selected a Chardonnay from California from the folks at Forlone Hope. This isn't just any typical California shard. The grapes are grown organically, the vines are harvested by hand, and the grapes are trodden by foot. When it's produced and bottled, no filtering occurs, so you really can taste the authentic notes of the grape varietal. Both Verdejo and Muscat are added, and that contributes a, a rich texture and a multi-layered complexity that can pair really well with dishes that have a lot of uh, flavor notes in them. Savory, sweet, rich, and that's why we chose this month's bottle. Cheers. Everyone and okay, welcome to Cooking with the Cap Times. We are um, so excited to have you here, both to everyone who is here in person and to everyone who's watching the live stream at home. This is our first Cooking with the Cap Times of 2023. Very exciting. Yay! Welcome! <laughs> so today we have a Chef Juan Umania from Jar Jardin. Very excited to have you, Chef. I'm going to pass it over to them in just a moment, but first I did want to thank our sponsors of this series. So our official kitchen sponsor is Kesnick's. That's where we are now. At Kesnick's, you can shop like a chef. You can come here to get all of your kitchen needs. It's a huge space. Literally everything you need for your kitchen is here. And then our other sponsor is Leopold's Books Bar Cafe. They are our wine pairing sponsors. So they have provided the wine that you just saw a little blurb for before. So they picked this wine specially to pair with this dish and you can go there and get that wine and lots of other wines. You can stop by to buy books, to get cocktails, coffee. They have it all there. I'm a big fan. And also one lucky viewer tonight will get the chance to win a bottle of that wine. The way to win is to ask questions throughout the, throughout the event tonight and then we'll pick the winner at the end. So keep those questions coming and we'll get them answered for you. And so everyone here tonight, I did want to mention, is a Cap Times member. That's why they get to come to these events live. <laughs> if you are interested in coming to one yourself, the way to become a Cap Times member is to give any amount to support our newsroom at membership.captimes.com. You can go to captimes.com and find that. And another perk of being a member is you get one of these fun t-shirts. We're gonna give one to everyone here tonight and nice. everyone who is a Cap Times member can get one. So what more do you need? <laughs> so now I'm going to toss it off to Lindsay Christians, our food editor, and she will take it away. Yes, thank you so much, Beck. And thank you everybody for being here. <laughs> Welcome to 2023. This is a great way to kick it off. Thank you so much for being here. Definitely, thank you. Thanks um, for having me. So, first of all, I just I want you to introduce yourself a little bit to the folks at home and to our wonderful guests here. Tell them a little bit about you and how, like, what you're doing over at Jardine that's so cool and special. Yeah, totally. So, again, my name is Juan Umania. Thank you for having me. Um, I am originally from Colombia. I uh, moved to the States when I was eight years old and lived all throughout the States. East Coast, Midwest, West Coast, and then landed up here in Madison um, back in 2020 through the whole pandemic mm. dispersal coming from California and been loving it ever since. I uh, started my food truck back up. I had started in the West Coast in Oregon, uh, focusing on local, organic, sustainable, doing all plant-based. And then from there, once I came here to Madison, opened it back up and through that networking, found the people at Jardin and they were looking for an uh, executive chef that was plant-based to be able to open up um, Madison's first plant-based restaurant and that's what we did so it's been an exciting journey so far <laughs> so thank you for coming through yeah. really appreciate it yeah one of the things that we so I am I am working on a story about what plant-based dining looks like in Madison right now just because it seems like it's gone through a lot of changes even over the past five years but definitely over the last decade um, and when we were having a conversation about it you said you know there's a, there's a lot of of plant-based restaurants on the west coast but not so many here so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of the challenges and rewards of doing plant-based food here in Madison yeah totally so um, I, in terms of challenges, I haven't really met many, you know, everyone's so excited and I think that's the great thing, right? Yeah. The, the market out here is people want to see more plant-based 
um, restaurants, more plant-based options. So as soon as even opening up the food truck, everybody just came in and, and was so excited to have. So for that, that's just like a very rewarding aspect of it is seeing that the community really wants that, is taking care of it and nourishing it. And that's really what, for me right now, it's, it's been great being here in Madison and especially the Midwest and Wisconsin. Um, seasonality, I think it might be a little bit of those challenges, but with that, it also opens up other doors like looking into fermentation, preservation, oh, yeah. um, pickling, all those other ways to extend the seasonalities throughout the winter times. But that also kind of makes you twist and use more root vegetables or use mm. uh, specific herbs or find those people that are doing those intricate, really unique, one-off uh, spaces that are growing year round. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. there are a couple. Yeah, <laughs> right? totally, totally. Um, I think one of the things that was really cool for me when I went to Jardine and we had, um, I went with a group and so we had like the whole menu basically. Uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I recommend doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but Definitely. one thing that I noticed, I am, I am not personally a huge fan of what I think of as faux meat or meat replacements. Mm -hmm. I like tofu as tofu and, and seitan as seitan, but like I don't like seeing uh, as someone who loves food, I don't like seeing like, you know, a vegan meatball. I want to know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know you're not maybe dogmatic about this, but you're not using really any meat substitutes in that way on your menu. And I wonder, was that a, a choice that you made sort of at the top or is that kind of organically how it came together? No, definitely at the beginning of the concept of Jardin, it was, um, for me, it's very valuable to showcase the ingredients and mm -hmm. especially showcase whole organic produce. Um, so with that in mind, it just seemed like for that level of high-end cooking, why not take it to that next step and showcase why are we trying to hide the vegetables that we're cooking with, right? Why are we trying to go back to the, the faux meats? Which there's nothing wrong with it, but it just, it's easy. And then sometimes you don't know what they all put in those processes. So highly processed things, steering away from highly processed ingredients, it's so important um, when you're talking about the health benefits, right? And even being out on the West Coast, I saw a lot of people, especially on the younger generations that are also starting to steer away from the, the meat replacement, the dairy replacement. They just want to see real food on their plates. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Totally. I have a question already for the chef. Oh, all right. Someone wants to know what your favorite dish to eat at Jardine is. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> that one's hard. Yeah. It's like, you know, we're as we're cooking, we're always tasting. We're always trying different things. But whenever sitting down and having a full component dish um, is very rare and I think for right now for me is the mole. Ah. Um, yeah, we're doing the Door County Cherry Mole. Oh. That one has so many different intricate layers. We're using tortilleria cepedas, large corn organic tortillas, um, and then we're layering this Door County Cherry Mole that we're also processing in their facility using their stone mill, oh, um, which wow. gives it a, a very unique flavor complexity to it. Um, and then that we finish off with a little bit of a chicory, carrot, ginger, hot sauce, a little bit of a plum reduction that gives some sweetness to the mole, and then finished out with some um, of our own style chimichurri, mm -hmm. right? Not very traditional. We throw a little bit of extra herbs in there, but okay. it still has that very chimichurri essence. And then our initial start was chicken of the woods, which was wild forage. And then once the season went out, we brought in hen of the woods, which is my takis. Um, my takis hold very nice meaty texture to it. Mm -hmm. And so we glaze it with a little bit of sesame oil, olive oil and give it that nice kind of umami flavor mm -hmm. and yeah I think that complexity behind that it just kind of just like the layers as you take one bite and you take the next bite it kind of plays with your palate which is amazing yeah the layers and like just the layers of flavor that was something that I kept coming back to after we had had our dinner it's just 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 the level of complexity in some of those dishes that you're able to build in mm -hmm. um, I think we see a little bit of that in the dish that you've chosen for tonight to demo for us Definitely. Um, so before we get started do you want to explain why you chose this dish. Yeah, totally. So definitely, you know, shepherd's pie. I love cooking rustic things, and especially since we're talking about, hey, can you cook this at home? Yes, definitely you can cook this at home. Um, I wanted to do a dish that had multiple layers, but it also had a little bit of a twist that I like to put on food. So it's not a traditional shepherd's pie. It's not going to be making um, a faux meat out of it as the ground meat for, for the filling. And then also I like to flip things around. So then therefore that's why the potatoes are going to be on the bottom. The whole creation of this dish was over a campfire. So we nice. just had a campfire, a huge cast iron skillet, let it cook over the coals for hours, and then just got this beautiful crisp on the bo bottom, almost like hash brown. Um, so yeah, so I'm teaching you how to do this, but in hopes that maybe once it warms up, 
and you have that bonfire, you're able to really put it on that on that testing skillet. Nice, yeah. awesome. Well, let's get rolling here. Okay, cool. All right, so again, this dish is gonna have three different layers, th three different components. So the way I like cooking is having things on the background cooking while I'm working on something else. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna be jumping around between one, two, and three different layers of it. But first off, have the potatoes already in the pot. Um, what I'm using right now is gonna be uh, Harvest Moon blue potatoes. So they're blue, but if, as you can see, which I'm about to cut up, um, they're nice and creamy in the inside, yellow. And what I like doing with the potatoes is starting from scratch, um, not having the pot filled up or hot. And then that way you bring up your temperature of the water with the potatoes and then they cook, get cooked evenly um, versus like putting them in a hot pot. Sorry, have to work over here with this sink for a second as we fill this water. Okay, and you gotta make sure that you have the potatoes fully submerged. Um, and you're just gonna let those roll. And once the temperature in that water gets brought up to temp and starts boiling, that's also got the p potatoes nice and cooking. And you let that roll for another five, 10 minutes. And that, that's when you start piercing and you get perfectly poached potatoes. But besides that, then also what we're trying to do is boil it all the way so the skin starts coming off. But just so you can see that they're nice and creamy potatoes. Oh, yeah. I already part boil them so you guys don't have to sit here and watch potatoes boil for <laughs> you know, 20, 30 minutes. Um, but we're gonna get that rolling first. Quick question. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I noted, my instinct whenever I'm doing potatoes is to just grab for my kosher salt and go whoosh, right in the, you know, lots of it. And you said don't do that because it's gonna throw your salt balance off, so. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Which, I mean, if you're really going for only just poached potatoes then it's really easy to throw a little bit of salt, bring it up to temp. But I also feel like when you start adding salt to the water, it allows it to cook and start boiling quicker mm -hmm. than the potatoes actually. So you, for me, it's better to have clean water, bring them from cold all the way to hot, bring it to a boil, and then that allows the potatoes to cook perfectly. So I don't know if you guys have had the patatas azules that we have on the menu, but mm -hmm. that's how we get that perfect little creamy texture, but they don't just fall apart. Right, okay. Right? Yeah, but right here, we're definitely wanting them to fall apart. You want them to boil all the way through and the skins are gonna start coming off of it, and then that's when we'll know they'll be ready to start smashing them up. Okay. okay? Cool. So yeah. then next, we're gonna move into the stew because that's gonna be the thing that's gonna take the longest, right? Um, with that, I chose to also hold off on processing a couple of the things. Um, I don't know if everybody knows about celery, right? But for me, that's one of my favorite uh, ingredients to use, especially in replacement of celery. And what we're gonna be doing is a style of sofrito. So we're using onions, carrots, which I chose to use some rainbow carrots as well which they're amazing. Um, again, a lot of these things we're getting lo sourced locally. And I just wanted a little bit of speckles in there, Those right? Those are so pretty. Yeah, so the, oh I love gosh. the purple, the orange that Those come through like gems. it. Yeah, and they have such nice flavor to them. You wanna try one? Yes, I do. Yeah, totally, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta try as you eat, right? 100%. Even raw ingredients, that way you know what you're working with. Mm. And then I also, very sweet. whenever I cut it off, I cut the bottom off first and then the top layer. Um, that way we can start peeling it. You can definitely use a peeler, but it's a lot easier with a knife. Um, I also reserve all that stuff for stock. I don't know if you guys make your own veggie stock at home, but I love doing that whenever I have loose ends, um, especially especially when I have delicious, flavorful things like celery yak, because they impart such good flavor to it. But yeah, we're just pretty much going around the whole way, making sure you're getting that tough skin off. But then all we're gonna have left over is the creamy center. And once that gets cooked down, we're gonna get a little bit of that texture also in incorporated into the stew, which will give it a little bit more of that heftiness, a little bit of more of that body. So the what we're also gonna do is try to cut it around the same size as the carrots. So we're gonna go through about, I would say, quarter inch slices, right? And then from there, I'm gonna slide them down and then go into a little bit of batons. So let me go right here. And again, I'm just showing you guys how to, how to cut up some, some vegetables because they're integral. And a lot of people, I feel like, choose not to use obscure elements to it, um, to their cooking, obscure vegetables, because they're a little bit afraid of how to cook them, right? Mm -hmm. Or how to cut, cut them, how to process them, all those things. 
And also, whenever making a, mir or, uh, a sofrito, I like using different cuts on the vegetables. Um, so I'll go a little bit on the finer side, then I'll also keep a little bit larger. Um, the larger ones, I try to keep to a specific size of how long I'm gonna be cooking them, but then the rest of them, I definitely want them to be a little bit on the smaller side so they start breaking down as they cook within the sauce. Um, that way you get a little bit of that incorporated. So a little bit more of that homestyle cooking, I think, right? Sure. Where that's how the grandma used to do it. It's different cuts that tend to different flavor profiles, different way that they're gonna interplay with the dish that you're making. So don't get too caught up in making a perfect square, perfect cube, perfect brunoise. Just chop it up, you know, have fun. And that's all we're, we're really trying to do when we're cooking is meditating, working with the raw ingredients and figuring it out as you go. Why did this try work? Why did this not work? <laughs> a lot of times you got you to experiment, right? We have a couple questions. One totally. from an audience member. Yeah, Taylor. Mm -hmm. What is a sofrito? <laughs> yeah, totally. So sofrito, it can be used in, in many different styles of, of descripting, but uh, you're pretty much doing a, a, a heavy oil saute with some aromatics. Um, traditionally, it's done with a little bit of tomato, onions, um, garlic, and carrots, but sofrito in Colombian cooking, we also do a lot of sofritos as well. Um, so it's really just dousing your pan with some hot oil, getting those aromatics rolling, um, and then with that, you create a sauce. Sometimes it'd be tomato sauce, and in this case, we're creating this thick stew sauciness with it. Yeah. I feel like there's like these bases in cuisines where it's like onion, celery, carrot, or like in, um, you know, Louisiana, you'll see a lot of green pepper in there, like in, in the mix of the things that you're starting with, mm -hmm, you know, your mm -hmm. aromatics at the beginning. Yeah, um, totally. I have a tendency to burn stuff because I'm not paying <laughs> enough attention. Um, and so my onions or my garlic, if I have garlic in there, garlic will burn for me because I'm doing too many things at once or I'm half paying attention. Uh, so when you say meditative, like I'm hearing that. <laughs> that just means you got to work with the heat, you know? You yeah. got to bring it down a little bit, give yeah. your time a little bit to relax, to cut up. And my electric will like eventually yeah. decide to do what I'm asking it to do. Someday I will have something more responsive than my electric <laughs> stove, but uh, a couple more yeah. questions. Yeah. Yeah. Go wants to know what alternative kinds of potato would Ooh. work for this? I mean, really any creamy potato. Um, I would say if you're looking for something that is accessible, Yukon Gold, um, any fingerling, even I would throw some fingerlings sometimes in there. Russet can be nice, but it is a little bit mild in my opinion. Um, so that's why for, for uh, potatoes, I love going with something that's yellow, creamy, that's gonna really break down high starch content to it. But hopefully, Sweet. hopefully those are some some options that you can find out there. Everything is so aromatic. Even the, the celeriac was really aromatic too. Yeah, and that's yeah. why I, I love cooking it up like this. That way you can start scenting it up, yeah. and once it hits that pan, then you'll start really noticing the aromatics. Um, but here I'm I'm doing a nice little mince with the ginger. I did keep the skin on it. Um, some people like to take the skin off, but I love leaving the skin on there, especially let's say like the potatoes as well, and for the ginger. Um, it imparts a different flavor complexity to things. So once you take that skin off, I think it kind of takes away from the depth. You start getting a little bit more of that bite gingery, a little bit more like that sweet candied essence. But when you cook with the skin, you get also a lot of enzymes. So it's really beneficial for you. If you don't have, yeah, definitely way more nutritious. So and as it's long- it's easier. And it's easier, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. I, like, I hate peeling yeah. ginger. Feeling wow. ginger it takes forever and it's annoying. Yeah. Like I would much rather do this. Yeah, the only time I, I really actually peel the ginger is if we're making a, any type of sauce. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah sure. or a soup that we don't want to have any freckles in there. Um, but besides that, always with the skin. <laughs> It'll make it a lot easier for sure. And then right here, we're using some local hard neck garlic, right? Yeah. I love hard neck garlic for mel multiple reasons. The flavor of it. Also, it can grow in this region. I love growing it myself in my garden. And then it's way easier to peel, right? And you get these larger cloves. So my trick for that is always doing a little slice on the bottom, right? And then doing that smash, right? And then from there, it just comes off super easy. I get nervous about the blade of my knife, and so I just like look around for a bowl or something and like yeah. smack it with the bowl. <laughs> hey, you know? that works too. And again, this goes for that veggie stock, right? Oh yeah. Don't forget about the even the the skins of the garlic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Those are so integral. Those are almost as valued as the actual 
vegetable itself, definitely. And Doris wanted to confirm, did you say you don't salt the water before or during cooking the potatoes? Correct, correct. Right? This is revolutionary, right? Yeah, yeah I feel definitely. Like this is a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get it. I totally get it. A lot of people love saltiness, so it, it brings the temperature to boil a lot quicker. That's See, I really didn't the, even know that it did that. I just know yeah. that, like, I like read the line in the red. I'm like, okay, yes, I do the thing, you know. <laughs> No, and so Peggy, it, it really Peggy is. Peggy asked, a... is it easier to cut with a knife than use a mandolin? Ooh, that all depends how um, comfortable you feel with a mandolin in your fingertips. That, that really is all, all it is. Like, I mean, I definitely, in the kitchen for fast pace, love using the mandolin. We definitely use cut gloves at, at the kitchen. I was like, I have, I have a glove that's oh, like yeah. steel wool or whatever. Because by it's then, it's not just it now, like so easy, but you're going against this blade, like you don't want your bare hands. No. I mean, the whole essence of like proper cutting with a knife, you don't want your hands just out and about, right? Yeah, so with that, I mean, I, for me, I feel more comfortable with a knife, definitely, even if I'm going with really thin cuts. But if I'm trying to move fast, then yeah, definitely, definitely a mandolin. Related definitely. question. Mm -hmm. Gunther wants to know, how do you cut that fast? <laughs> really? Thanks, I Gunther. feel like I'm Actually, cutting very yeah, slow, dude. Question. You should see me at the kitchen. That's for sure. For sure, I'll cook way faster. But anyways, yeah, cool. So. Oh, Taylor, another question. Yeah. Sorry. Do you have any future plans to like bottle things and sell them at the restaurant? Mm. We can always just have things at home. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. That's definitely in, in the mix, for sure. We've definitely talked about it, especially, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know Vitruvian, they have a uh, home or a online store. They're building a deliver. farm store. They're, exactly, yeah, yeah, big. yeah, yeah. So we love partnering with local um, purveyors, local vendors, and they also do that as well. So in part, we're definitely in our near future hoping to figure something out with bottling. Definitely. Our definitely. friends over at Cadre, Evan, he does uh, some stuff with Vitruvian, has been doing that since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I've bought several of those things that are delicious. One time I bought uh, what I thought was cheese dip and turned out to be butter oh. <laughs> and served it to friends <laughs> by accident. I was like, it's melted cheese. No, it was not melted. Uh, it was butter uh, by accident, but cool. yeah. I, I want to just take a second to say that MJ from Leopold's has outdone herself this month. This is delicious. Yeah. This is a $19 bottle of white, and it's it's beautiful. It's like this perfect balance between like a little bit of minerality and citrus and a full body from the Chardonnay in there. It's just, it's wonderful. I do and love that. I just want to plug it because I'm enjoying it so much here. So thank you, MJ. Thank you, Leopold. We love you. So anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, it is good. I love that wine. We yeah, actually yeah. It's so carry good. some Queen of the yes. Sierra at the restaurant because they're the natural wine. Yes. Oh, don't get me started on, on some natural wine. For real, definitely. OK, so I got the pot coat, er, warming up for the beans. Um, I'm going to use some garlic confit oil to get that heated up to start that sofrito. Um, yeah. I'm throwing so, a good amount of oil in there. So I want you to tell people what is in this garlic confit oil. So in, in your recipe at home, I have you using olive oil because we have olive oil at our homes. Um, but what he has here uh, is it smells amazing. Talk, talk about how you make yeah, it. Yeah, totally. So um, if you've been in the restaurant, we have our seasonal flatbread that has um, cauliflower and garlic confit crema. So what we do is submerge cauliflower, a little bit of nutritional yeast, a uh, couple other spices in there with the garlic. Let that confit for a very extended amount of time. And, you know, about an hour, 300 degree oven. And then from there, we strain all of that substance out. We hold on to the oil and then mm -hmm. we keep on reintroducing that and using it for our cooking in different um, dynamics. And it, it smells amazing. I mean, it, it really, especially anything you add that to just gives it a nice little oomph behind it. Yeah. So I highly recommend it. I have some uh, garlic confit, garlic confit oil that Milk Street Kitchen sells in a jar. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to do it all yourself, Milk Street Kitchen does sell it. Um, and th I, that's a great, it's like a little cheat. Yeah, yeah. totally. It's, it's just like, yeah, it, it <laughs> yeah. takes like three, yeah. four different yeah, steps yeah. to it. Okay, so next, cool. Potatoes are starting to, to get a little bit of bubbles going. Um, from here, already warming up the oil, throw a little bit, all of your aromatics, which is gonna be the onions, the carrots, and then what we just did over here. I also saved bundling up the herbs, which I bundled up um, the thyme and the oregano, but I didn't do a, a full-on wrap around it. I definitely want it to be a little bit loose. That way, once we throw it in there, 
um, some of these leaves start kind of popping off and falling into it and incorporating into the actual mix. But then it'll make it a lot easier to just pull this all out yeah, true. and get it out of the way. Cool? So I'm going to yeah. throw this over, bring yeah. this over here. Livers. We do not deliver yet. I want to say that we are working with um, a partner to start the delivery, but we do do to-go orders. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Okay, cool. So uh, let me slide over here real quick, grab a little bit of a mixing spoon, and then throwing this bundle in, start mixing that up, get some nice high heat on this mix. That way you start kind of hearing that sizzle and start getting a lot of that aromatic coming through. Um, and once that starts kind of browning up, especially because that already has the garlic in it, garlic's gonna be the first sign that you're gonna be looking for for it to start kind of browning out. Once we get that going, then we'll add our spices and our bay leaves and let those uh, start blooming into the mixture. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I love doing the essence of adding those dry ingredients, um, the dry spices into whatever you're cooking before you incorporate any type of liquid because that just opens them up. It really intensifies the, the smell and that's what some people call blooming um, because then once you incorporate that liquid, that's already kind of in, infused into the oil and it just has much deeper, richer um, flavor profile to it. So highly recommend doing that. Nice. Definitely. So I do notice. So there's there's garlic in the recipe here. Mm -hmm. um, are you you're using garlic like on top of the garlic confit? So mm -hmm. if would you increase the amount that's in this recipe because they're starting with olive oil? Yeah, I definitely okay. would Give say. More garlic. Yeah, throw <laughs> throw more garlic. You can never go wrong with more garlic, right? Yeah. When in doubt, garlic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you got a whole bulb, throw the whole bulb in there. You know? It'll be fine. It'll work very well with the potatoes and the, mm -hmm. the gravy as well. So. Definitely recommend that, definitely. Cool. Gunther okay. would like to know how long you have been cooking. Um, I've been cooking, ooh, that's an interesting question. So professionally, definitely started when I was 16, um, wow. but at home, been cooking since I was a little kid. Um, that's definitely one of those things that inspired me to cook, and my parents always cooked at home. My grandma, both my grandmas love cooking, um, so they would always be doing those home meals from scratch, and for me, that was one of the joys of life was running around, coming into the kitchen, seeing everybody cooking, asking where I could start helping out on the, on the kitchen. And it would always be, you can make the juice. And yeah. from there on, then I moved on to saucier, then Garmo, and then all the other tricks until here now. Cool, so getting that nice sizzle, which is great. Um, smells good. That garlic confit is starting to smell great. Gail would like to know if this is a pretty broad question, but do you have? She really liked the tip about the ginger, and she wanted to know if you have any other similar tips to that that people might not know. Hmm. Hmm. Ooh. I mean, I think it all. There. Everything has a little tip to it, you know. Um, so, it would. I think it would have to be a little bit more specific on what ingredient, what we're looking for. You can parboil potatoes and then keep cooking them later. Like yeah. that's one already. Yeah. Like there are a lot. I feel like that's actually the beauty of this, of th that we do this yeah. demo thing. Is I learn little stuff every single time, and I'm like, I didn't know you could do that. Chefs have all these secrets. Mm -hmm. So you yeah, know, as, as we cook, let's make it easier on ourselves, right? <laughs> just because we're having to do this day in day yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. So how do you can you find those little cheat, cheat codes? Is is really the, the integral part. Yeah. Sure. yeah. I think actually another tip would be just that your sofrito does not have to be like uniformly every single thing is exactly, because I always thought like, well, they're gonna cook at different times if I don't get it exactly right. But if you have some of them a little bit bigger, like, you know, your celeriac will cut a little bigger than your carrots. Like, that's a cheat too, that's nice. You know? Totally, yeah, and I think it, for, for that one, definitely it, it all, the way I look at it is what are you gonna be doing it for? How long is that gonna be cooking? If it's gonna be a quick tomato sauce, then definitely keeping um, a certain size with your onion and your carrot, but then you can always go smaller with that within that same mix, right? So just the largest one is what you wanna focus on. Everything else can go smaller, go really small sometimes. I, I mean, a lot of times when I'm doing carrots, I pull them all to the side and just give them a quick little rough chop to break them even down a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. And then those just kind of melt away as they cook and then it intensifies the flavor profile a lot, a lot better. Nice. So that's definitely, definitely a little cheat code because then you're like, oh, I don't have to worry about how heavy I'm going with my, with my cuts or not. 
I have a more specific question now. This person would like to know, do you find it harder or easier working with two people as handsome as Armando and John? <laughs> and out of those two, out of those two, who do you think is slightly more handsome? Ooh. Ooh. And would you like to guess this one's the name get me of the person trouble. who asked this? Yeah, um, I'm definitely gonna guess it's Jen. Who's that? No, I'm kidding. It's probably gonna be our John. It's John. Yeah, it's John. So of course, Definitely John is the, you know, <laughs> cutest out of the two. And I wish they were just in the kitchen a little bit longer. You know, I, I want to see more of them in the kitchen. You know, I, I want to see John start rolling up his sleeves and coming through, helping yeah, out a like little bit. Yeah, that's what I hear about John is he's, like, he's not there enough. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. No, he's, he's awesome. I mean, okay. I definitely, that's one of the things. He's definitely gone in the kitchen and helped out many times. By so. which I mean he's there all the time, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now... I don't know if you guys are starting to get all the sense, the smell of, of everything cooking. So from there, good, good. That's the way to start. It's gonna be a long process, so no, I'm kidding. So here I already have um, all the spices blended up, right, uh, that you can follow in, in the recipe. So you got your turmeric in there um, and your black pepper. Also, I'm gonna throw in the bay leaves as well, dry, right? Get those infused with the sofrito. Um, that way, even the bay leaves start blooming as well. I asked you about the salt. I thought it was kosher salt. You said, no, it's pink salt. What's pink salt? Yeah, pink salt, Himalayan salt. Um, I got a little jar, which I'll show you. Um, for me, it's one of the things that I love cooking with the most because of the salt content and the minerality. Um, it just has so many different unique mineral notes to it that other salts don't have. And also, I find it a lot harder to over salt with pink salt, ah. you know? So you can really, as you're painting that canvas with whatever you're cooking, you can throw a little bit more of that pink salt, a little bit more, a little bit more until you get it to that right level versus sometimes you can go with kosher salt and it just like hits you way too hard and you're like, all right, now I gotta start all over or make a double batch of whatever I'm making. I was salting carrots the other day and I like accidentally just put a bunch of salt on one and I find myself wiping salt off of a carrot. I'm like, what is my life? <laughs> this is not, yeah. this is not it. Like, I've definitely yeah. been there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially like potatoes too. Like in Colombia we do boiled potatoes but then afterwards you, you coat them with, with salt. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely been times where I've accidentally thrown way too much salt and be like, okay, ah. I think I might not have to rinse these and have to try it all over yes, again. Yes, right? Yeah, yeah, oh. definitely. Yep. So okay. Angelica would like to know if you have a tip for prepping leek. She says she always is guessing. She doesn't know where to cut. There's dirt in it. Can she use all of it? Yeah. So some people, I don't know. I think there's two different camps. Some people say just the white part. I'm all about use everything of your vegetable, right? Yeah. So the whole thing, totally, totally. Um, and the greens just take a little bit longer to cook. But I definitely use the whole thing. So let's say this is the leek right here. Dirty that. spoon. Let's use it. Um, so you got your leek. I do a, a long way cut, but I don't go all the way through. Um, so that way you still have this connected at the bottom and then you can fan it out, mm -hmm. wash each layer because each layer is definitely gonna have some dirt in it. Mm -hmm. Go back around it, look at it again, wash it, and then make sure that it's fully clean. And then from there, I just, um, it all depends on what I'm doing. But I, I definitely, we used to do on the truck, on the food truck, um, these potatoes with some sauteed shiitakes and leeks, and we definitely use the, the tops of it. A little bit of tamari sauce and this um, paka sauce that we used to do out of tahini and citrus. And it just, yeah, people loved it. It, it definitely, I get calls about it all the time still, if we're still making those, which we aren't, but maybe we'll bring those back sometime. Yeah, all right. Yeah, definitely, yeah, sorry. So definitely cut off the root, but I do that after I've cleaned them because the root also helps hold it. Yeah, yeah, because if you cut that, then you're just gonna end up with a bunch of different layers. For sure, for sure. Bonnie okay. would like to know, how long can celeriac be stored and how do you store it? Ooh, yeah, so celeriac it can <laughs> actually withhold fire. for a while, for a very long time. Um, definitely like a month, two months, um, and it all depends on what environment you have it in, definitely store it in a dry, cool environment. Um, I usually store it in the fridge in one of the vegetable drawers, but it, it can withstand. I mean, that's definitely why it's seen as um, a winter root vegetable, right? And yeah, then Angelica longevity. has another question. She asks, what about fresh herbs? Do you use the same amount as dried herbs? No, yeah, that's definitely gonna be um, a little bit different. Um, that's gonna make it a little bit tricky 
when doing conversions, but what I love about fresh herbs is that you use a lot less. Um, maybe you have to process a little, a little bit more, but it definitely imparts a, a intense flavor behind it. But I would probably say doubling it if you're going with dry. Um, that would be my guess for sure. Cool, so here I, I already incorporated the cannellini beans um, now that I've bloomed all the other ingredients in there and then covered it with some water. Usually, if you're going from dried beans that you've rehydrated, um, you wanna do about an inch of water to surface area. But if you're using canned beans or these pre-cooked beans that I did um, from being rehydrated, uh, you can do about, I'd say about like a quarter inch above. Um, that way we, it has enough time to cook, but then also starts reducing and you don't end up with too much of a watery substance, um, especially for this stew. Yeah, nice. Yeah. All right. Cool. So we got the water boiling. So around this time, you kind of start paying attention to the potatoes, making sure that you don't um, let them dry out or once they start breaking, they'll be ready to mashing up. So I say from here, let's move on to the gravy. Yeah. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Cool. You were talking about tossing the mushrooms with the sesame oil and stuff, and I was like, yeah, that's, that's this. We're going to be doing this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is great. Definitely, definitely. So I'm going to start moving some of these things over here in this direction. But as you can see, I did bring a mushroom block so everyone could see mushrooms and how they're grown. That's not how they grow naturally, but that is how they cultivate them nowadays, which is amazing, right? Um, let's see, let's see. It's called a mushroom block? <clears throat> yeah, 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 definitely. I didn't know that was the term for it. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so we're getting these guys from Vitruvian, which is pretty awesome. They are amazing people. They've just started experimenting with king oysters, and these black king oysters have a nice meaty texture to them. I'm going to go ahead and chop off a couple of these guys so we can start chopping them up and cooking up this gravy. But um, yeah, you can start finding these around town. These are similar to trumpet mushrooms, which I highly recommend also using if you can't get your hands on some of these um, black king oysters. Doris wanted to know, with canned beans, do you drain them first? Yeah, I'll definitely drain them, rinse them. Um, same thing with rehydrating beans. I like to let them sit overnight in water, but then pour out that water, rinse them with some clear water and then incorporate them into whatever you're cooking for sure. I don't think I have that note in the recipe. I'm going to grab a pen. Yeah, totally, totally. Cool. So here we're going to start knocking out the mushrooms. What I like to do is divide the stem from the cap just to make like like-minded things come together, you know? And I definitely am one to say that using stems of mushrooms is okay. You know, a lot of people like throwing them away. Um, the only time I would really get rid of that stem is if it's too dried out, um, if it's okay. been sitting for too long, especially with like shiitakes, that happens. But if you get some fresh shiitakes, especially the ones that you can find at the co-op, um, definitely use the stem. I mean, I, I don't think there's any reason not to be using the stem, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's the dried out thing. I think sometimes I get them and then I don't cook with them for a couple of days and then mm -hmm. I can't use the stem. But but what you it's can nice always definitely, right yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, feel that texture, just so rubbery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, amazing. Yeah, very spongy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I super spongy. <laughs> <laughs> I like good, good. rubbed my nose and I was like, no! Oh, there you go. <laughs> no one's getting any of that. Right? Oh my it's God. fine. Right. It's okay, fine. Good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good. Um, yeah, so what was I mentioning about this? Oh, yeah, no, you're saying you, sometimes you do throw them away because mm -hmm. of how they are also throw them in your stock, veggie stock yeah, yeah. Um, we do that a lot especially when we're processing our mushrooms because we make our own veggie stock in-house at the restaurant so even with that whenever we don't want to use a certain part of the mushroom we throw it in the veggie stock and we've noticed like night and day whenever you start doing that you get such good flavor behind that um, it adds such a deep rich umami flavor to any veggie stock that you want to use and then from there you can really add it to whatever you'd like um, especially this stew, like the stew we're going from um, scratch, clear water, but you can definitely use some uh, veggie stock if you'd like, some veggie broth. But the only thing with that is that I would say just keep in mind that it, it will change your, your flavoring. So 
That's what, another reason why sometimes if I've thought about where I want to take this dish particularly, um, and I've already thought of the components, what are the spices that I'm going to throw in there, what vegetables I'm going to be throwing, then I like to use just straight water because it won't dilute, oh, it won't sure. change the profile of it. Um, where if I know that I'm going to be using veggie stock and I want to keep it simple, I don't want to add too many vegetables, I don't want to add too much um, seasoning behind it, I just want to keep it nice and simple, veggie broth. You know, that's what we do for our wild rice on the restaurant as well, where it's just very light white sage, a little bit of garlic, and then we also throw veggie stock, then that just imparts such nice notes to um, the wild rice. I feel like the thing with the veggie stocks that you get at the grocery store is they mostly just taste like carrots to me. Mm -hmm. But then when I've made veggie stock at home, I have to be careful, because I eat a lot of, I love kale, like Tuscan kale, dinosaur kale, you know, the... And, and, I got, and I'm like, kale stems can go in stock. And I learned <laughs> you can only put so much brassica in your stock before it just starts to taste like cabbage. <laughs> and then you're sad. Um, right, at least right. I'm sad. Yeah. Uh, and I like, I like brassicas, but like, it, it, they can take over my stock pretty quickly. So I, have to, I feel like I've had to learn how to balance some of those things of like, oh, OK, too much celery can make it kind of bitter uh, if I'm not careful, right, mm -hmm. if it's in there too long. So how long do you cook your veggie stock? Is it, it's not as long as a meat stock, I would imagine. No, no, no. That one is very short and simple. It's not about uh, the long process like some other uh, meat-based stocks. Um, we usually kind of bring our stock to a boil and then let it simmer for about 20 minutes and then pull it off and then pull out all the inside out of it. And then that imparts enough flavor to it. And also, like, another cheat code that we like using for that is... Sorry, I'm going to reach over. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um is adding a little bit of tamari, a little bit of miso and, yeah. and cumin and chili powder. And then that just makes that veggie stock wholesome, round some. Um, you can throw it in anything. Sounds like we have a viewer in Australia, which is very cool. Oh. She says in Australia, she hasn't found mushrooms that big or they're harder to come by. And do you think bigger mushrooms have different flavor profiles? Definitely, definitely. I mean, it's like any other um, plant-based, organism right where if you have it small it's going to have a, a different flavor profile than if you have a larger of let's say a pepper or a cabbage um, for me i think mushrooms they depend on when they want to be cultivated so depending on growth also another thing whenever cultivating mushrooms they um, do put artificial light to make them grow a specific way and that's how you get the either leggy mushrooms or you get short stack mushrooms. So it's really all about the, the growing process. Um, so I think variability that depends on was it picked young? Um, is it gonna have a more bitter taste to it uh, if it's older? And then also how was it grown? It was the environment very fruitful for it? And the lighting, was it too intense? Was it too dark? So yeah, I think it would all really just depend on trying it out and seeing if that, that mushroom, the smaller mushroom or the larger mushroom is gonna work, for right. sure. Cool. And someone would also like to know how to tell when a mushroom has gone bad. Oh, that one usually slimy when they start getting it. slimy, yeah, They're definitely. Slimy. When they start getting <laughs> very slimy, um, or you start seeing a uh, deep white fuzz around it, um, <laughs> that could be another reason why. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, compost straight up. Straight into yeah. the compost. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what they they do at Vitruvian as well. So once they grow and harvest these uh, mushrooms, they use these blocks and throw them in their compost. Um, and, and these are made from reusable um, wood shavings and soy husks. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And they, make, they sterilize it, they clean it, and then that's where they inoculate it and, and start this growing. Okay, I want to really see. quick show the seasoning that you're using here. So, yes, please, um, please. When I'm editing these recipes from chefs each month, I will look for ingredient, like the any ingredient that they call for that I don't think we can get. So I have all these shortcuts now on my browser that are like all the grocery stores in Madison. Um, they do have like char chorizo seasoning, like at Woodman's, it's like a whatever taco kind of seasoning. Um, but this spice house is a Milwaukee brand. Mm -hmm. um, I am a huge fan of Penzi's and also the Deliciouser. Delicious or I don't think has a chorizo blend right now, um, but Penzi's very well might. Um, but Spice House is another wonderful spice company. 
we're blessed with lots of them, I think, in Wisconsin. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of call attention to that. Uh, for sure. At the Milwaukee Public Market, you yeah. Can find I mean, the Spice, Spice House out. is amazing for blends. Um, yeah. That's one of my favorite places to to source, especially again. I try to focus on sourcing locally from um, any type of local purveyor, and the Spice House is one of those that just like knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I also still source a lot from our old pals over in Eugene, Oregon, um, Monroe's Herbs, which I've also seen that they carry a lot of their stuff at the co-op. And I think they also have amazing quality, organic, fair trade, um, and any of their spices, we use those a lot in the restaurant, and just have a completely different flavor profile. So that's another integral thing, right? You can kind of focus on some fresh ingredients and try to figure out, okay, yeah, this, uh, this celery act is in season, it's fresh, but then also once you start using those spices, you want something that actually speaks, that actually has that aromatic behind it that will give you some nicer notes, make everything easier. Um, but yeah, cool. So what I did here, chopped up the trumpets, threw a little bit of sesame oil, and then some of the chorizo seasoning, and then from there, have this pot um, heating up, and we're gonna throw the onions in there with a little bit of olive oil, start caramelizing them nice. Um, you get that, that sauciness, the sizzle. To follow up on the mushrooms, Angelica wants to know if they are not slimy, but they go blackish, <laughs> can you still use them? <laughs> if they go blackish, I would probably say steer away from that. <laughs> I would definitely not work with those if they turn black. Definitely. <laughs> but again, I mean, mushrooms are, there's so many different types of mushrooms that it's hard to say how one of them is going to react, how a blemish on one is going to be an actual um, infection and fungus of decay and rot from another one. So um, tread with that lightly, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Eileen would like to know, she's on a low salt diet. How would you modify this recipe to reduce the salt without losing the flavor? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I would probably to reduce salt on that, um, maybe incorporating just a little bit more fat behind everything, um, especially for the gravy. And yeah, I think salt is one of those things that it does its work because it brings things up. Um, but for me, I like to use it at a lower level, not actually having it be so in your face, so salty. Uh, maybe you could also emit yeah, no, we're not using much tamari here. So, no. yeah, I think salt you're is really, a hard one. Honestly, you're not using, you're not using that much salt. Like, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I use more salt, right, at this point, you know. Mm -hmm. But but I also hear a lot from chefs that, like, the, the things that make restaurant food so restaurant -y is salt, fat, you know, mm -hmm. the things that we are kind of more tentative about when we're at home. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you're on a low salt diet and you're cooking for yourself, you're already ahead of the game. Yeah. yeah. Right? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I think that for me, uh, um, salt can come into a place sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but then in other times, it just right at the end, just to yes. finish it off. Once you've just already finishing. worked with everything, you already have all your components and your flavor there, um, really then you just add your salt to round out the last little palate note to it. Yeah. Yeah. And then Angelica wants to know, when you say local, do you mean going to farms and markets or smaller businesses? Ooh, um, all question. of it above. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I definitely like to go to the source, right? So definitely love going directly to the farmers, um, getting in touch to, to knowing what the farmer's whole vision is behind what they're growing, what they're cooking, also being able to see the land. And um, with that, then yeah, um, pr purveyors, when you're talking about producers, small craft makers like Tortilleria Cepeda, um, being able to, to mm -hmm. see their operation and understand what their ethos is, is really important to me um, because I, I do like supporting individuals that have that like-minded set where it's like we're focusing on sustainability, bettering our, our environment, our agriculture system. So for me, it's the locality is also interplayed with ethics. It's not about just like, mm -hmm. oh, I got this from down the street. It's like, well, I got it down the street from this person who's doing this and who's uh, mm -hmm. focusing on helping out the planet, right? Hence, one of the reasons why I went vegan, right? <laughs> yeah, I gotta help how the long, animals, help the planet. Um, I've been vegan for about eight years now. Oh, and I was vegetarian yeah. for a year and then kind of jumped back and forth um, before then. 
but yeah, the vegan trend has been hitting right. You know, it just feels right. Everything that I'm doing, um, everything that I've been working with, it just it just keeps on aligning me towards that goal of hey, my ethics align with my actions, right? Yeah. You know, I think that that's where a lot of us kind of hold true to, right? It, it can be hard going out to eat. It can be hard to, to buy things at a local shop, right? And that's another thing where local sustainable things um, are higher higher priority than just locality. Yeah. When uh, when are you gonna go vegan? <laughs> Uh, I hear you'll be doing a little bit of I mean, vegan, vegan uh, dining soon. It is, it, is, it is pretty difficult, I think, as a food writer uh, to be anything other than an omnivore and an enthusiastic omnivore. Um, but I have also noticed that my body doesn't actually love a lot of animal protein. It mm -hmm. just doesn't, I don't need it personally. Mm -hmm. um, but then I end up with not getting enough protein in general at all. So I have to be more conscientious about that. Otherwise, I'll just eat, you know, bread and cheese. Yeah, totally. And wine, well, the, um, which is the, the beautiful thing <laughs> yeah. about Madison is that we have an amazing, educated, nutritional vegan yeah, around here that knows do. how to get We're all like your proteins, yeah. get all the right vitamins, all the I nutrients. Can. Yeah. All right. Cool. We're getting nice roll on everything. Potatoes are almost there. So once we're done with this gravy, this we'll start so mashing good. it up. Yeah. Are you guys hungry? Yeah. 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 You guys getting kind of hungry? Yeah. Like, yeah. Especially now with all that smell in front. That's I, the way to do it. I love the idea of like all of these different spice blends that can take things in different directions. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also discovering that like I need to have both the Penzi Zatar and the Delicioser Zatar because they're different. And now I need both. Like, yeah. so. Totally. It's just an embarrassment of riches, I think. It's no, been really good. I mean, I'm sure if you go in my, in my spice cabinet, uh -huh. you'll see multiple of the same blends yep. of spices, but from different makers. Because mm -hmm. you got to test them out. I'm a you maximalist. Gotta test them out. I'm a pantry maximalist. Yeah. And I own that about myself. Uh -huh. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah. the journey. You know, yeah. I, I love using spices. Mm -hmm. Always constantly using spices. For some people, it's clothes. Different kinds. For me, it's mm -hmm. spice blends. Keep on yeah. using them. Ooh, audience questions. Yes. So totally. the protein in this dish is the question. Yeah, so I mean that is the misconception, right, that um, we kind of highly focus on high protein, but everything has protein, right? The potatoes have protein. Um, they have a good source of protein. Mushrooms have a good source of protein. Um, so you're getting your fill of protein in this dish for sure. The beans definitely hold a little bit of that weight of how that protein intake. But with the mushrooms, with the potatoes, with the gravy, um, everything's going to add, give you a good amount of protein. Um, that was definitely something that I always thought that I was going to struggle with when I went vegan, especially living the high active lifestyle, you know, biking, hiking. Um, but if you eat ver versatility, you eat a lot of variability, you are able to get all your nutrients, all the things that you really need from just a dynamic diet. Okay, so we're starting to get a little bit of that char on the bottom of this pan. I don't know how heavy we're going to go with it, but you want to definitely start seeing as you slide that, that spoon across to feel a little bit of things sticking because that's going to be the heart and soul of this gravy. Um, that's really where a lot of that flavor is going to be coming from once we incorporate the roux and then we incorporate the oat milk into it. Um, you'll start seeing that it also aids in that nice color behind the gravy but yeah we'll let that roll just maybe one more minute one I love, more minute i love that you're using oat milk in this i always have oat milk in my house because i like it in my coffee uh it just tastes good and so but the idea of just subbing it in something that calls for milk i probably wouldn't do that because i don't have to like i'm just mm -hmm. like oh i can just go buy some milk but why not use what i already have in my house if it's gonna totally. work yeah, you know, 100%. in something like this. Yeah. Yeah, and like for this uh, for this dish, we're using very um, we're using coconut milk and yes. also oat milk, and they both impart different flavors and different profile, different textures, textures to the dish. Textures for sure. Yeah. Different textures for sure. Totally. So like oat milk, I love using that for bechamel style because of the oats, that nice little oat flavor behind it, wow. and then it just thickens up naturally. Think of oatmeal, mm -hmm. right? It thickens up really naturally, so. For a, a nice cream sauce, you want something that already is going to do a lot of that legwork for you, for yeah, sure. That's lovely. 
Okay, there we go. Now we're getting a little bit of that darkness. All right, so now throwing a lot of these back into the bowl, and then we're gonna start whisking up our roux. So even I, I leave a little bit of, of this stuff in there so you can start seeing it crisp up as well as we're making this roux. Um, it'll give it a nice little color to it and flavor it. I would like to know what your favorite oatmeal and your favorite vegan yeah, whisk. Ooh, good question. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry. Yeah. What was the question again? <laughs> My bad. Yeah. Ooh, okay, so Oatly is definitely gonna be my favorite um, oat milk, right? Ooh. Yeah, Oatly, Oatly for yeah. sure. Let I me mean, uh, go ahead and pop this one off the pan real quick while we get our stuff ready. Oatly is delicious. Um, yes, it is. Um, or no, sorry, sorry. No, we use uh, Pacific and another uh, brand at the moment, but at home I definitely cook with, with Oatly for sure. Um, it just only is a little bit harder to do big batches of cooking, just hot price point. But I think flavor wise, that's definitely the best one. Okay, so from here now we're gonna throw in coconut oil, get oh, that yeah. rolling, right? And that's what we're gonna use to make our roux. And your favorite vegan butter. Favorite vegan butter. I think for me, um, I do steer away a lot from um, butters, but I do like Miyoko's. Miyoko's is definitely I think has just a, a very unique flavor to it. And it also, yeah, yeah. Have you had Trader Joe's vegan butter? I have not. I it's didn't even know that they made it. It's the Miyoko's Cube that has the cube. Oh, really? Okay. Okay, I will. I, I'll have to. Yeah, back in Oakland, I used to live like right down the street from Trader Joe's. So used to hit that up. But now I'm a little bit more on the east side. So I haven't been to Trader Joe's for a while. I didn't know that they were doing vegan. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. I'm totally down with that for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. we, have a, we have a recommendation for the country crack plant butter as well here for anybody who's looking for a rack. Cool. Yeah. So, as we're getting that blown down, does everyone know how to make a roux? Yeah? yeah. Everyone yeah. here? Okay, perfect. You guys already know. You'll notice I already put in know. the recipe warmed in part because that was like a thing for me when I first started making roux. It's like, oh, it helps if the liquid is warmer. Yeah, a little bit. yeah, totally. At least no, for it's, me. And it also helps with uh, preventing breakage. Ah, definitely. okay. Um, incorporating just a, a warm substance to a, a hot heat uh, allows it to not break away. For sure. Okay, cool. So now we're going to start adding that flour and whisking it in. Get that rolling. I'm glad you're demoing this here because I think making a brown roux is a little bit different than making a blonde roux. Mm -hmm. And just let, like getting people to know like at what point do you stop? Because there's all these levels of roux. You can get pretty dark with a gumbo or something like that. But Totally, totally. And then a reason why I'm using a saute pan instead of a, a yes, sauce yes, pan, yes. Yeah. right? Um, saute pan just has a higher surface rate area. Um, so once we incorporate the liquid, it's going to also cook out a lot quicker than if you're doing it in a saucepan. It's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, so there's sure. a, definitely a little bit of that cheat um, at the restaurant. That way we don't have to be here doing a, a hard roux for 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> um, when you're doing a saute pan, because you have a lot more of that hot heat hitting it, um, you brown out your roux a lot quicker, you cook your flour a lot quicker, and then also once you're trying to reduce that liquid content, have it evaporate, you have a lot more of that surface area for it to evaporate quicker. But also, I mean, I love making roux because of that flavor notes, right? And uh, instead of yeah. going by it for how it looks, um, I go by it by how it smells. Once you start getting that nuttiness, it's really, really, really nice. Right now, it's just um, coconut oil and flour, um, which if you want to make it gluten-free, yeah, and then, of course, using the pan drippings from um, the sautéed mushrooms and onion. So and if you see little blackened bits, it's from, from doing the mushrooms in the pan first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, I, again, um, I don't like to clear it out all the way. And then as you're whisking it in, it, you start getting a lot of that kind of breaking down, for sure. Doris wanted to know if the sesame oil is toasted. Um, is the sesame oil toasted? I would assume so because of the color of it. Um, when it, you have that dark sesame, it usually is toasted sesame, for sure. Um, and I love that robustness 
that's one of my hacks for vegan cooking for sure. Um, sesame oil and, el and pr pretty much anything you want to have that nice meaty substance to it because it just has, m mimics a lot of that animal fat behind it, right? And with that, I do do it very small ratios. I don't like going too heavy, too intense with it either because you don't want whatever you're cooking with to end up tasting just like sesame oil. Yeah. So it's just small ratios, small proportions for sure. I often see it added at the end of things, like a, you know, a drizzle of sesame oil at the end. Mm -hmm. Totally. Because it'll take over. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it does smell really good. Yes. Right? You start getting that scent yeah, of like... And a little bit of that, <laughs> that toastiness, yeah. right? Yeah. So like, that's what we're going for, because that's going to be a lot of that foundation of the roux. Uh, sorry, of the gravy. Um, you want that toasted, almost like burnt popcorn. Right, it's starting to smell a little bit like that. It reminded me of really popcorn, yeah. Some popcorn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this, we're not gonna go all the way super dark. Um, we got it kind of where we want it, where it's starting to, to thicken up. That smell, it's already getting that nice little popcorn-y smell. And then from here, I'm gonna incorporate the oat milk. And then we're gonna do it in small batches, right? Don't go too quick with it. My oat milk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oat milk for sure. And you see how it just thickened up right there? And then now we're going to add a little bit more. And then again, small batches as you thicken it up, right? Um, don't go all the way in because then you're going to be here cooking, steering for minutes on minutes. And you just want this to be done. You know, you want to be able to lick the spoon with a little bit of that gravy. So again, going with it small batches you see it just thicken up in a nice little paste nice little color and again this is a little bit on the lighter side but once we incorporate the rest of our spices you will get a, a nice little color to it nice little country gravy for sure what do you guys prefer a little clean gravy or country style gravy country style right oh, yeah oh God, exactly so flavor. exactly always and just like a little bit of that chunkiness in there you know it's it just makes this gravy pop a little bit more, right? It doesn't feel like just a sauce, but I really just a nice, I could just scoop it up like a, <laughs> a soup. Definitely. Okay, cool. So see now, see that barely took any time, right? It's already there. You already have it reduced. It's already nice and thick. Um, and again, having that saute pan versus a saucepan will aid in making this 10 times quicker, 10 times quicker. Cool. So from there, now um, we're gonna go with, let me make sure, start making a little bit of this clearing up. Then we're gonna incorporate, bring this down. I don't know why it keeps on popping up all the way up. I don't know if I'm unconsciously doing it or what. Yeah. <laughs> the pan's excited, yeah. Yeah. Also, this is a first for me. Making a little uh, gravy over induction burner. Over induction. Yeah. 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 And I, I asked for this specifically so that you could see it a little bit better. Because um, I know it's easier to do it over a, a flame. It's a little bit more uh, familiar. Totally, totally. But hey, it's working so yes, far. Yes, you know? totally. I mean, it definitely took a little bit of caramelize, but now it's it's starting to get that. And then now, now let's go with the rest of the spices, which right here we got white sage coming from Mount Rose Herbs, um, some nutritional yeast, a couple other spices in there that are gonna really just kind of fill it all up. Yeah? Yeah, 100%. So nutritional cheese, high in protein, B12, very good for you. Um, it's just dehydrated, a specific type of uh, yeast. And once incorporated into any mixture, you start getting a lot of those cheesy notes. So whenever we make vegan cheese at the restaurant, when I make it at home, always incorporating a little bit of nutritional yeast. Um, also in anything that you want a little bit of that chicken flavor. I love using it almost like a chicken broth substitute. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore that's also why we're using it into this mixture because it just rounds everything out really nicely. Look at um, that color. Yeah, that's yeah, beautiful. totally. So from here, we're done with the gravy. Oh, gravy done. We got that Great. rolling. Got a nice little thickness to it. And that's going to thicken up a little bit more as it cools down. But that's what we want. Yeah, you know, that's make beautiful. it a little bit easier. All right. I mean, awesome. brown food is brown. That looks delicious. Dude, yeah, <laughs> but then a little bit of those golden colors from the mushrooms yeah, as well. Yeah. Like, that's what makes it pop really, really nicely. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. 
Okay, so real quick, let's go into the mashed potatoes, get this stuff rolling so we can start eating. Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna bring these uh, potatoes over real quick, empty out the water from them. Um, now I got a nice little makeshift potato smasher, right? Okay. Let me slide that one over real quick over here. All right, I'm gonna get out of your way. Yeah, thank you. Question, yeah. Where can we get this recipe? <laughs> oh, so this is a thing that happens every single time. Right. So the, the people, it, yes, it. right, because you don't get it because you're here. Um, the people at home all got sent this recipe a week ago, and I'm continuing to edit it, as you can see, uh, for anything that he says that changes. I will make these edits probably tomorrow. Um, but Beck would love, she's got all your email addresses, I think, for all of you, um, and she can send you the recipe. It's on Google Docs. All of them are. So we are, next month, I think, is two years of this show, and we have recipes for everybody who's been here. Um, so including several stat. vegan recipes. Yeah, it's going to be pretty stat. great. Yeah. Are you using a spoon? I am, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, ask Beck. Beck Dude, Beck. yeah. Smash it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm short for Rebecca. Yeah, I mean, definitely yeah. when I'm making my mashed potatoes, I love to leave them a little chunky. So I don't like to do a rice, uh, a ricer, or go with anything that's going to completely demolish them um, because of that texture. And then what I did here is I emptied out some of that water, but retained a little bit of the uh, boiling water because it has some of the starches, so it's going to help thicken it up. And it also has a lot of flavor profile behind it. It picked up some of that that flavor from the potatoes. And again, leaving the skins on. Please leave the skins on. It's gonna change your mashed potato again. That's so great, Completely, yeah. completely. Right? Um, the flavor is amazing. And then with that, doing a dry mash um, makes it a lot easier. But then from there, we're gonna incorporate um, the rest of these ingredients. Right? I just, I really love things that like are better for you, make it taste good, and are easier. Totally. It's a win, totally. win, win. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. So we got ourselves some coconut milk. Again, I use coconut milk in mashed potatoes because of the creaminess, the high fat. Yeah, full fat. Yeah, definitely. Coconut can. Go with a coconut can. Don't go with a, a makeshift coconut um, milk in a sense, right? Because they're just a little bit too watery. Yeah, 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 no, go with the cans for sure. Yeah, exactly, the ones that you gotta shake it to make sure it's incorporated all the way through. That's the best ones, The co-op just had a sale and I bought like five of them. Really? So, those are the spices right there, right? Those are all the dried spices. I'm about to throw in vegan butter, which this one's gonna be Earth Balance. Um, that's the one that we use at the restaurant, easy to access. And then also rosemary, which I'm gonna chop up a little bit real quick um, to throw it in there because I use dry oregano just because it has um, a nice intense flavor to it. And once you incorporate it into this mix, it starts kind of opening up. But then the fresh rosemary, gotta do it because there's nothing better than fresh rosemary, right? There's nothing better than fresh yeah, rosemary. Yeah, especially rosemary mashed potatoes. That's the thing. Um, so yeah, right now, definitely just mixing it in. Um, I like adding the rosemary towards the end sometimes because um, I don't want it to overcook. I also don't want it to start wilting. I want it to keep it fresh. And then since I'm already pouring this out of the, the heat, then it's just gonna work with that residual heat and start pulling all those, um, all those essential oils out of the rosemary. Carol wants to know what your preferred brand of canned coconut milk is. Ooh, preferred can, yeah. Which one? The blue can. The blue can, yeah. I mean, I like the green can. Yeah, the green can's probably one of my favorite. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, hey, different reality right there. Yeah, the same one, though, yeah. <laughs> exactly, for sure. Um, yeah, I can't remember the name of them. Um, but yeah, the green, the green coconut is probably one of my favorites, um, just because they also do ethical things. Full fat, for sure. So the spices in this, for everybody who doesn't have the recipe, uh, it's, it's the fresh rosemary, dried oregano, garlic powder, white pepper, black pepper, pink salt. Mm -hmm. Those are the spices. Definitely. So, pink Himalayan yeah, salt. Yeah, pink Himalayan salt. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm all about, for sure. <laughs> all about the pink Himalayan. Okay, so let me chop up a little bit of rosemary. 
Um, and again, super easy. I'm sure everybody knows the trick, but pulling off the stems off of the rosemary, you just go one full swoop down. And then once I start chopping, um, there's a little technique, because I feel like sometimes when you chop rosemary, it just ends up flying everywhere. I don't know if everyone's got that same problem, but <laughs> I definitely do end up with rosemary all over the kitchen and sometimes in my face. But yeah, so I usually just put that hand over and just start chopping away. And that kind of helps with maintaining, containing the rosemary um, nice and tight. And then you start kind of going back and forth, piling it on. Rosemary, rosemary, rosemary. Kitchen yeah. hack. Kitchen hack again, again. And again, um, I like keeping some of the bigger pieces in that rosemary as well. Um, so once you take that bite, you get a nice little rosemary bite to it. But then also going with a little bit of that finer chop. Um, so it really gets lost within the mashed potatoes. So do you have a preference? I mean, sometimes like there's a lot of dried available. Mm -hmm. Is that like half what you would use fresh? Or um, double dried? You know, I think it also depends on the herb. Some herbs get a little bit more intensified dry when you dry them. Fresh yeah. For herbs is the question. Yeah. How right. For rosemary. For rosemary, um, I think I would probably go with double. But I, honestly, okay. I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. To be, I don't want to steer you the wrong right. way. How yeah. About oregano. Oregano. Um, definitely double. Yeah, I definitely do double on the oregano for sure. Yeah. How long can you keep dried spices? Ooh, a very long shelf life, for sure, especially on how you store them. Um, as long as you keep them dry, I don't think that, um, I would just, I don't know on that one either, to be honest. I, I tend to, I, if you smell nothing mm -hmm. to me, then I don't. That's when you throw it away? Yeah, I yeah. usually do. Even if, if you like smash it a little bit? If you smash it, yeah. So yeah. yeah, if I smash it or I warm it up and then yes, some, I get something, then great. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like it's like spice to spice almost, where it's like, well, like th this I just really can't keep. Like it doesn't, you know, it, it, it tastes like nothing so quickly. But some will just last almost forever. I, yeah, totally. I definitely agree. Um, question real quick. How much time do we have? Where, where are I don't we know. Back, how are we on time? You know, as huh? much <laughs> till the dish is done. Yeah, <laughs> In other yeah, words, I think right. that we're over. We are. Yeah. We are over okay. time. We are over time. All right. So, all right. Cool, cool. Well, well, and let's, let's bring it home. Let's definitely start doing the build for sure. All right. Um, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and bring out this cast iron right here real quick. Do it. Yeah. Thank you. Ooh. So the build is going to be pretty easy. Um, again, preheat your ovens um, 400 degrees. And definitely, I think for allowing it to sit for uh, 30 minutes uh, to an hour is the best call because it just keeps that temperature hot whenever you're throwing anything in. Um, doesn't have the oven kind of work itself back up to temp, which is really nice. But cool. So have it at 400. And then we're gonna start building it a little bit of mashed potatoes first. And again, like I mentioned, um, I do it a little bit on the twist, right? Yes. Try to get that bottom nice and crispy. Um, and you can definitely even, depending on what cast iron you have, go with a little bit of uh, a higher temperature. Um, if it can handle it, definitely go with it. But, so throwing the mashed potatoes down, doing a nice little swirl, um, especially Sometimes I like letting these chill so they tighten up so they're a little bit easier to work. But while you're throwing this in there, um, definitely start making this dibbit. That, that's where that gravy's gonna go. And you're making this nice little lasagna to it. So that crevice, crevice, crevice. And also this allows you to create like a nice little rim, pushing up your potatoes up all the way and then making sure that it has a nice little even bottom. And then from there, we're going to go with the gravy. Gravy next. And then from there, same thing. In the middle. Right in the in middle. In the middle of the divot. Do a so good amount of skip. Potatoes, divot. Yeah. Yeah. Almost like a little volcano type thing happening. And then with that, also start kind of pushing around Again, bring up that wall. 
Keep going with it. Keep going with it. There you are. And then, lastly, the beans that are cooking, right? And they've kind of started reducing, right? And then at this point, whenever I'm cooking beans, I don't steer it at all until, until they start becoming nice and tender. And then that's when I start doing the steering. Um, that way you're not disturbing the cooking process of the beans. And then once I start seeing that I have that right amount of liquid behind it, um, steering it also incorporates some of those starches, the thickening agents from the beans, and you start getting some nice, nice thickness behind it. Um, let me pull out now the bay leaf real quick and the bundle. This is the fun part right here, fishing for the bay leaves right Fishing here. for bay leaves. Yeah. yeah. That's what he's doing. But if you're interested in getting this lovely shirt and supporting local journalism, you can do that by becoming a Cap Times member. This is exclusively for Cap Times members. You can do that at membership.captimes.com. Give any amount to support our newsroom, and you can support this shirt. Let me shirt. Real quick and grab this guy. Thank you. Yay! The shirt's really soft and... It's just a very soft shirt. It's a very cute shirt. Right. Kind of yes! Oh. <laughs> there you go. Oh, nice. Madison. All right. <laughs> okay. I love it. Okay. And from okay. here, now we just start adding. These so beans. You're, you're using a, a spoon that has like holes in it. So yeah. You're not using all the liquid. Totally, totally. Definitely using slotted spoon. And again, also these beans, if you made them ahead advance, they'll thicken right up. So a lot of this liquid will just be jellified, and you won't even need to use a, a, a slotted spoon. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah. But because we're going straight in. What your favorite vegan umami flavor is? Ooh, vegan umami flavor. I would have to go. I think it would have to bounce between um, mushrooms and tamari. Yeah, I think those are those are the two that I love cooking. Always have them in my house. Always have them in the, in the kitchen. Definitely. Oh, I'm kind of team miso. Team miso? No, I love I me some miso least, as well. Yeah. I always have at least four misos in my house at any oh, given time nice. because I love miso. And I, so, brown, so what are your white, favorite white. miso out of all the different style of misos? I mean, I tend, I really like brown miso, uh, but red probably. Red, yeah. Yeah, I love yeah. red miso. I love white miso, it's so beautiful in dressings. Like salad dressing with, with white miso is amazing. Um, for a while I was just making this carrot white miso dressing all the time. And it's very good. White carrot miso. Yeah, it's, so it's so it's you shred carrots into it and you use white miso and it's delicious. Ooh, that's really Ooh. good. I'm gonna need to try that it's for very sure. Good. So then from here, this is where yeah. we would put it into the oven, cook it up. Um, we're gonna set it over here on the side because we already got some already been cooking. So those are ready to roll. Definitely. Kitchen magic. Yeah, for sure. Television magic. Julia Child, save the little. <laughs> so I'm gonna slide. Th I'm gonna slide this. Oh yeah, do it, do it, do it. Them. Do it. What you mean? Thank you. Julia Child. Grab this right here. Okay, cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're rolling. All right. Can I grab them? Yeah. Oh, they haven't gotten there. Yeah. They're like crust on the top. Is that all right? Yeah, that's so chill. I don't know what's let's, happening let's right now in the this. oven. <laughs> Could be anything. <gasps> okay, this one is bubbling, boiling for sure. All right. Okay, so again, that recipe says to let it sit for a few minutes. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Trying to mess up my cutting board here. Dude, it's too beautiful of a cutting board. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. My mother-in-law used to always say, it's not yours till it's broke. <laughs> so, you know? Yeah. Thank you. We love you, Gail. Awesome. Cool. 
But yeah, she used to always say. All right. Look at this, it's beautiful, gorgeous, right? Yeah, nice and bubbling, boiling, and then the last little touches. The last little touches though, this is what is gonna make it pop, right? So always, I love interplaying with different types of textures yes. and different flavors. So again, here are the pomegranates. <laughs> yeah, the red hot Do a little bit of pomegranate. <laughs> Make it look like it's Christmas again, seeds. right? Yeah, and Listen, pomegranates. Listen, doesn't have these anymore. You have to go know, other places for them. I know, in season, the I season know. is, right now, January is like the last of the stretch of pomegranates. But I so. feel like Woodman's yeah. thinking how to cut the corners. Woodman's has some. Oh, uh, you don't. I almost thought about bringing and showing how to yeah, how to cut a pomegranate. Yeah, it's, there's, there's a whole trick. Methods. Totally, I use, I totally. use water, and I open them over water. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you could smack the outsides, too, and all that, but, like, yeah, yeah, I love doing the little, like, cut the top off, the hat mm -hmm. off, and then hitting the wedges and popping it Break open. Break it open, yeah. Yeah, no. for sure. <laughs> I love pomegranates. I'll show I you. Next every, next yeah. cooking class, I'll show you how to do <laughs> pomegranates for sure. Yeah. yeah. Toasted <laughs> walnuts. Yeah. Toasted pecans, sorry. Pecans, pecans, yeah. Toasted pecans oh for a little God. sweetness. Totally, a little bit of crunch and texture. Also high in protein. Protein, exactly. <laughs> Bringing in a little bit up. all together. And... Then the last touch. Oh, they're so colorful now. So right? Pecans. Yeah. So, toasted some pecans. toasted pecans. Yeah. Yeah, I like no. to toast them with a little bit of olive oil, chili powder, and salt, and that's it. Um, and then from there, lastly, we're going to throw the little zest, little oh. lemon zest. Mm. And that's going to nice and break up that richness from the, from the gravy, from the stew. Um, it really just adds a nice little layer to it. A lot of people that come through the restaurant mention that I have a high interplay with acid, and it is one of my favorite ingredients. I think I actually mentioned that to you. I don't know if I did, but yeah, yes, no, it, I it's think important, you did. Because our food shed here in the central Wisconsin, Midwest, whatever, in the upper Midwest, we don't have a lot of natural acid in the food shed. So you're you're looking for like your apple cider vinegar, or you're looking for something like that because mm -hmm. it's not from here, you know. So you're you're looking for that brightness. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I tried to be like more of a local vor, like intensely, the thing I missed most was totally, totally, yeah. And I mean, I love searching the city like everywhere. Like I love doing kombucha vinegar, um, making vinaigrettes out of that, incorporating that kombucha into anything Ooh, I yeah. can. Um, just because the way that that is so lively, it's amazing, amazing. Cool. Mm. And then that's it. That's the shepherd's pie. Yay! That's the flip on the shepherd's pie. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Hope you guys learned something. Yeah. yeah. You were amazing. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Yes, we got lots of other people in the chat saying they really appreciated yeah. the detail, how much yeah. you taught them. So thank you so much for yes, joining thank us. You. Yes. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank awesome. you to our in-person audience. Thank you to everyone who watched online. And thank you one more time to Pesnix for hosting us in this wonderful space. Uh, and yes. to Leopold's Books Bar Cafe, people love the wine. So <laughs> I love it. Yes. Get yourself a bottle. And yeah. thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Appreciate it.